Hello and welcome to Beyond Boundaries. I'm your host, Justin Douglas. I have two great guests today that I'm looking forward to introducing you to, Elaine Enns and Ched Myers, authored a book titled Healing Haunted Histories, A Settler Discipleship of Decolonization. With everything going on in our world today, it becomes clear that our history is haunting us and we need healing. So check out the show notes and description for a link to healinghauntedhistories.org where you can get a copy of the book. I believe it's there for 20% off discount, a 20% off discount through May 31st, I believe. Um, So yeah, check that out. And obviously after you listen to this episode, I think you're really going to want to read that book. Um, Please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. That really helps the podcast. Uh, Part of what makes all this possible is when you give to my Patreon, it helps cover the fees that make uh, it available on platforms like Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or wherever you're listening. So uh, if you could do that, the link is in the show notes. Um, but anyway, I hope you enjoy uh, my interview with Elaine Enns and Chad Myers. I think it was a, a really, really interesting conversation about the history of our country and so much of what we need healing from and some of the creative ways that we can go about uh, restoring amid all of the brokenness. So enjoy the podcast. All right, I'm here with Elaine Enns and Ched Myers, uh, and they are here to talk about their book, Healing Haunted Histories. Really excited to dive into this book and to learn more about their work. And so, um, Elaine and Ched, welcome to the podcast. Thanks Thank for having you. Us. Great yeah. to be here. Yeah. Uh, why don't you give the listeners just kind of a brief overview about who you are, what you're about, anything they should know about you uh, before we get started? Sure. My name is Elaine Enns. I I grew up in uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada, um, in a in a tight knit Mennonite community. Um, and in my final year of college, I volunteered for the Big Sisters Little Sisters program, and I saw the holes in the criminal justice system, uh, and that led me on a journey to Fresno, California. Um, And this was in 1989, and I started working with the Victim Offender Reconciliation Program, which is a part of the larger um, restorative justice field. And so I have been continuing that work for the last 30 some years, working to broaden and deepen practices of restorative justice, which, you know, took me to this Healing Haunted Histories project. And uh, my name's Ched. I'm from Southern California, fifth generation Californian. Elaine and I are partners in life and work. Uh, I did not grow up in the faith. Um, came, Came to gospel faith as a young adult. And pretty quickly in the early 1970s, um, found various strands of the radical Christian movement at that time, including the Catholic worker movement, um, Catholic peace, peacemaking and resistance communities, uh, radical Baptists, radical Presbyterians, and so really kind of signed up for life in uh, what we called then and still call today the radical discipleship movement, um, which has had lots of expressions in the English speaking world. Um, in, uh, I, I worked as a community organizer for about 10 years, worked with indigenous people for about 10 years internationally. And then in uh, 1998, we started Bartimaeus Cooperative Ministries, which is what we, is our platform still today. So we've been in this almost 25 years now. Um, and uh, our work is, theological education, um, advocacy for social justice, um, building capacity for um, across the ecumenical spectrum for those working at, as we say, at the intersection of the seminary, the sanctuary, the streets and the soil. So Mm. that's a little bit about us. I like that. Say that again, the intersection of the the seminary, sanctuary, streets, and soil. Wow. And sometimes we add psyche and soma because mm. this is all about how we are healing, not only, you know, how we are thinking, engaging with our minds, but also what we carry in our bodies. 
And so somatic healing is as important to the framework that we're developing. Just a little bit too much alliteration though, so. (laughs) No, I like it. I like it. Speaking of alliteration, the book is called Healing Haunted Histories. That's good. Uh, Tell me what Healing Haunted Histories is about, or just like, I don't know if you want to give like, if you were in an elevator with someone, we can make it fun. Like if you were in an elevator with someone and you had to tell them about the book before you got to like, you know, the top floor, what would you say? Or what would be the, the, the intro to the book that you would tell someone about? Nice. Depends on how many floors. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, I grew up in this tight knit uh, Mennonite community in Saskatchewan, Canada with a rich understanding of my Mennonite heritage and family history. But what was missing in our communal stories was that we had historically unwittingly participated in the violent dispossession and displacement of indigenous communities. Healing Haunted Histories is my exploration into these wounds, silences, and hauntings uh, through the lens of what we call landlines, bloodlines, and songlines. So the aim of the book is to help white settlers like us seek justice and healing for ourselves, our land, our societies, and our faith. Uh, Because we settler and we Christians broke treaty covenants with First Nations people, and so our book is an invitation to begin repairing that breach. Wow. Okay. Well, so, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. What was that? I didn't mean to interrupt. In, in, uh, interrupt. No, I was joking about that was a really long elevator. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot of floors there. No, but that, I mean, this is a pretty, uh, uh, a pretty serious topic, a pretty serious book. You can't, I think one of the things we live in a world that wants sound bites. We want, we want to bring someone on and in 30 seconds, have them defend some, incredibly difficult and challenging subject and not really get into the nuance of it or the difficulty of like education around it. And so I appreciate you taking the time to do that. I think that's really important. So what led you to write a book about healing and decolonization? Because these are two pretty serious topics and uh, maybe each of you have a different reason uh, for what led you to write a book about this, but I'm just curious your personal journeys and desire to write a book about such serious topics, but also such necessary topics in our world right now. Yeah, thank you for that question. Healing Haunted Histories is part memoir, part social, historical, and theological analysis, and then part practical workbook. And so our process invites settler Christians and other people of faith into this discipleship of decolonization. And so we wanna ask together, how are our histories, landscapes and communities haunted by continuing indigenous dispossession? How do we transform our colonizing self perceptions, life ways and structures? How might we practice restorative solidarity with indigenous communities today? So for me, there were many stepping stones on this journey. One was when I was 13 and I interviewed my grandmother about her experience as a teenager in Ukraine during the Russian Revolution. Another, I mentioned it briefly, was in my last year of college in Winnipeg when I volunteered for the Big Sister Little Sisters program and I mentored a Cree girl. This is what led me in 1989 to leave the Canadian prairies and move to Fresno, where I began this work in restorative justice. And I facilitated victim offender dialogues and worked with uh, lifers in prison. Then I, then I got the opportunity to work with the Greensboro Truth and Community Reconciliation Program. That was very influential in me understanding how restorative justice theory and practice applies to systemic racism and historical injustices. And then the last one I'll mention, and I know this is a lot, but I got to travel to Ukraine in 2010 uh, to, to learn about my grandparents and the history of that place and see the land and feel the pain and, and also hear the songs um, of where my grandparents lived. 
Awesome. So really the, <clears throat> what, what we're trying to tackle here are essentially the oldest and deepest injustices on our continent. Um, these are violations that inhabit every intersection of settler and indigenous worlds, past and present. Uh, these colonization has generated wounds that are woven into the fabric of our personal and political lives. Uh, and we're trying to explore in this book how to heal these wounds through both an inward and outward journey of decolonization. Um, we are writing as settlers and for settlers to explore the places, peoples and spirits that have formed and have deformed us. Uh, so for 45 years now, I've been looking at a, <clears throat> a practice of faith that tries to put uh, issues of racial justice um, and uh, disparity, economic, social, and otherwise, and violence at the forefront of what it means to follow Jesus. <clears throat> and uh, obviously so much has happened in the last year around these um, kinds of concerns uh, right through the pandemic, disparities have deepened, um, killing of innocent lives um, by police, and now these shootings over the last week. So you know, these are issues which are again surfacing. It's it's our opinion that when these things happen, um, we are experiencing how haunted our um, our society is by unresolved issues from the deep past. Um, so we were, uh, we actually start the book um, with this amazing mm. quote from Martin Luther King Jr., our greatest American prophet uh, that he wrote in 1963 in his book, Why We Can't Wait. He says, for too long, the depth of racism in American life has been underestimated. The surgery required to extract it is complex and detailed. As a beginning, it's necessary to x-ray our history and reveal the full extent of the disease. And then he says famously, our nation was born in genocide mm -hmm. when it embraced the doctrine that the original American, the Indian was an inferior race. Even before there were large numbers of Negroes on our shore, the scar of racial hatred had already disfigured colonial society. It is this tangled web of prejudice from which many Americans now seek to liber liberate themselves without realizing how deeply it has been woven into their consciousness. Well, that, <clears throat> those, those two paragraphs go right to the core of our uh, dis-ease of white supremacy and the pathology of white entitlement. And we're struggling with it on all these different fronts. Um, and we decided that um, in this book, we wanted to try to really go to the core uh, of those issues as a way of responding to current events. Wow. Um, so with that, would you say that this book is more of an education on our history of colonization or a guide to um, how to respond in the here and now or a little bit of both? Like, I'm just curious that I, I know so much of what we need is to educate people because I don't think our education system has done a great job expressing uh, the realities of how uh, racism has, has so shaped our culture. Uh, but then there's also the reality of like, okay, you can get as educated as you want, but what's actually going to change? What are you going to do? And so curious if you, you know, had to kind of say what, what the book's doing one way or the other, or share a little bit about both of those, you know, factors within the book. Can, can you share a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, what, when we talk about this book being part um, workbook, what, what it, we are really hoping readers will do is 
at the end of the six main chapters that, you know, that's the bulk of the book, there is a list of questions about understanding first your ancestors or your, but most folks that are gonna be reading this will have, have ancestors that have immigrated um, to the United States. So it is a understanding of our personal, familial, communal history, doing the hard work of understanding why our people, our ancestors left their homeland, the push and pull factors, um, what, how did they come voluntarily, involuntarily? What, what are all the stories and the realities um, that we know about that they're coming, choosing to leave or being forced to leave their home country and coming to North America? Because what we are trying to do is to get folks to do the hard work of understanding the immigration history in their family and through the, the work of doing that critical research, we will get to all of the big um, societal and historical issues that you are talking about. Mm -hmm. So rather than uh, working from a perspective of the, the big national issues, we are encouraging people to do the research of the very place that their ancestors settled and the very place that they have now settled and what are the issues and struggles of, of justice and the violence that has happened on that soil as part of the colonial process and what is our responsibility to work at healing that, that violence and the colonial legacy that is, has touched every part of Turtle Island and is certainly where you and I are sitting right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Justin, you know, <clears throat> white Americans and, and white Christians, um, oftentimes if, if we do try to broach these big questions, we become easily overwhelmed or um, shrug them off as overly complicated or distance ourselves from them. You know, this isn't about me, this is about the past. Um, <clears throat> and we're trying this book to um, get every reader to see that we are all deeply entangled in this history and this present, uh, that we cannot exonerate ourselves um, through some individual moral hero heroism that distances itself from this history. That we, we are all, <clears throat> as King put it, you know, deeply entwined. And therefore, we've got to do some exploring and some unentangling uh, in order to become what we call responsible, able mm -hmm. to actually engage in current questions, uh, whether those are questions of um, policing, which I know you've done some, some work in in your community, uh, mm -hmm. questions of racial equity, questions of indigenous solidarity. Um, these are not issues that are outside of us. And we're gonna write a, a book of facts as if new facts are gonna change old habits. Rather, we want to see how this whole conundrum, this, this disease is within us. It is around us. It is part of the air we breathe. It is the fabric of our culture. And as Christians, we, we want to work to heal. Um, and so we, we do some interesting reflections on exorcism in the gospel stories uh, as a way of... Um, sort of analogizing the profundity, depth, and breadth of, of this kind of work, without which we simply won't be either willing or able to change 
the systems that actually determine our, our behavior. Mm. That's interesting that you use exorcism as like the idea of like needing this. I mean, it obviously fits with the title healing haunted histories, like the idea of like, you know, exercising <laughs> this, uh, uh, that's a very, I think that's a very sens- like sensational, like um, a picture that we get when we talk about that, obviously with Hollywood and movies and such. But I also think it's, um, uh, it's meant to be transformative. It's meant to be, um, you know, um, really to, to, to challenge the, 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 the future path of that individual who might uh, have that type of an experience. Um, and it's also incredibly uh just miraculous right like that's the kind of the picture and there's part of me that's like i look at the situation we're in and i i I say this because i have i have friends that like if i said decolonization they wouldn't even know what i was talking about they they wouldn't know what that even meant and if i kind of tried to give them just a brief overview of it it would be the explanation of like well that's not my problem that's not you know, I, I'm not responsible for what they did back there. There's this kind of like immediate um, apprehension to even have the conversation because um, they don't want to assume any responsibility, uh, even if even if the systems and structures that are at play today, maybe they benefit from. And then the other extreme of like, um, you know, just constantly wanting to frame everything around that conversation. And I'm not necessarily saying that extreme's wrong. I'm just saying like, I think there's just this difficulty and like, it almost feels like it's going to take a miracle to, um, to find ourselves in any kind of reconciled state. Like when I think of like Zacchaeus and his story, it's like God, Jesus reconciles him just by the grace of having a meal with him. Doesn't necessarily, we don't get any of the, the like details on like what was said there, but we do get, Zacchaeus saying he's going to give half of his possessions to the poor and then he's going to pay back anyone he's, you know, defrauded like four times the amount. And um, there's a pastor, um, Leonce Crump, who, who said reconciliation requires defrauded parties to be made whole, not just apologizing for the offense. And I heard that like three or four years ago. And I was like, wow, that's a different framework of reconciliation than I grew up with. Like the idea that defrauded parties need to be made whole and it may be just and i'm honestly still in process four years later since hearing that quote of like how do we get to that point can you guys maybe share a little bit of like what your definition of like decolonization but also like reconciliation looks like um just for those who maybe this is something that they want to learn more about and 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 maybe you can kind of give them a picture of like what you're hope hopeful for that like the impact this book might have or the impact like moving closer toward reconciliation looks like and you know healing this haunted history that we have yeah let let us uh, try to address um each of those points let's let us say a word about the exorcism analogy a word about decolonization and then a word about reconciliation as reparation um because these are really core um strands of this of this project um jesus is a healer uh, and a big part of his healing ministry as we encounter it in the gospels is exorcism and uh you know we we find it difficult to encounter that in our modern secular society that's kind of dismissed by modern rationalists um and it's highly spiritualized and privatized by conservative Christians. Um, And so we kind of fall off both ends there um, about something that's so central to the the mission of Jesus. We see him exercising in two different modes. Um, In the story of the famous story of the Gerasene demoniac in Mark five, he clearly (laughs) understands demon possession as the occupation of a country by a foreign army, which is why he names the demon legion, unmasks that form of oppression, which is political, but also embodied in the personality of someone who's literally being um, forced to live among the dead um, 
in an occupied territory. Um, I think you've been to Palestine and you've, you've seen a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Temporary yeah. Um, mode. Um, so that's, that's understanding how powers of death occupy space. And we have a long history of the powers of death occupying the lands of first peoples throughout North America. On the other hand, Jesus also um, exercises individuals such as in Mark 9, a young boy who can neither speak nor hear. Um, <clears throat> and that is also a phenomenon of haunting because when we are haunted, we tend to be shut down. We are silenced or we are silencing. Um, and so recovering that sense of how unclean spirits dehumanize us both personally and politically is a really important thing to recover as church. So we, we key in this book on one of the strangest stories of exorcism in the gospel tradition, which comes from Luke 9, uh, where Jesus says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a person, um, seven more, even more, uh, more unclean come and reoccupy uh, that space. And we see that as a, um, a really poignant um, diagnosis that what we're dealing with here are, is a labyrinth of layers of powers of death in ourself and in our society. And that's why we call it discipleship. This is not um, seven easy steps to firmer thighs. <laughs> and, and this is not a, a cheap and easy um, apology um, as if that's going to bridge a racial divide. This is a lifelong journey to heal inwardly and heal communally and heal politically um, that we think the church ought to have a central role in. So Elaine, what, what does decolonization mean? Well, as you noticed, noted, Justin, the term decolonization has become very popular um, mm -hmm. over the last decade and to some extent has become diluted in social justice circles. Um, Unengank's scholar Eve Tuck argues that decolonization should connote the concrete struggle for the repatriation of indigenous land and life. And it should not, however, function simply as a vague metaphor for all things we want to do to improve our societies. That's an end quote. And we very much agree with this. What we understand a settler discipleship of decolonization to mean is informed by what the great Audre Lorde calls doing our own work. So again, it's learning the history of the lands where our immigrant ancestors settled and where we live now and the struggles for justice in those places. It's about reckoning with harms and building our capacity for response ability. It's combating the ways that we settlers practice willful unknowing and moves to innocence. And it's about making covenants and taking concrete steps of solidarity in relationships with communities that have been injured by past and present injustices. And so at the conclusion of the book, we highlight practices of reparative initiative. So repatriation and um, acts of reparation taken by individuals, denominations and governmental bodies that are experimenting with decolonization. And what we say in this work is that no step is too small and no step is too big. And so encouraging us as individuals, churches and denominations and governmental bodies to begin experimenting with how we can do practices of reparation and repatriation. 
So you bring up the question of, or the example of Zacchaeus, mm. and, and rightly so, um, most white North American Christians who are middle class uh, have completely lost uh, the notion that reconciliation in the gospel and in the New Testament is predicated upon redistributive justice. Right, so yeah, yep. Zacchaeus is reconciled because he actually, um, following Levitical commands on uh, making reparation for theft, he restores fourfold and he redistributes half of his wealth. That is, according to the Apostle Paul, how in Second Corinthians five and six, how reconciliation happens. It's literally the balancing of um, the books. Uh, so we, uh, in the final chapter of the book, we start out with a reflection on the infamous and much ignored story of Jesus and the rich man in Mark 10, uh, the, the one story in Mark's gospel where someone is explicitly called to discipleship and explicitly refuses to follow because it very specifically calls this man of much property to redistribute his wealth. That is the substance of reconciliation. Um, so we, you know, we've got this culture in the church, but also beyond the church. You find it in white politicians all the time who, who just want to sweep away, um, whether it's a racial gaffe they made when the, they thought the mic was off, or whether it's uh, some past um, <clears throat> massacre that's happened. They just want to sweep all this away with a, with a cheap apology. And there it, it's becoming increasingly uh, difficult to get away with that because um, more and more people, particularly people from oppressed communities, um, they want to know how actual relations are going to change structurally. Uh, as a result. So people are looking for, uh, in the case of African-Americans, concrete reparation, monetary or otherwise. And when it comes to indigenous peoples, they're talking about hashtag land, land back, right? They're looking to have lands that were stolen or taken by fraud, to use Marx language in the gospel, um, that is by um, violating treaty agreements, they're looking to have that land restored. And as, as Christians, <clears throat> uh, we have to understand that this is that molten heart of gospel discipleship is to um, explore what it means to live a discipleship of decolonization as reparation and repatriation. People mm -hmm. are going to be much less interested in what we say and are looking uh, at what we do and particularly how we deal with resources. Uh, so that's, that's where we're trying to bring folk and including ourselves in this book. It's a lifelong journey and, and it has to have the fruits of uh, redistributive justice, which quite frankly, in capitalist America is still considered a high heresy. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I was going to say. I mean, I think, I think that's the struggle, right? I, I, I also think it gets infinitely more um, complicated as time goes on and as alternative narratives are not only spoken, but believed about origin stories and such. And I think in our particular case, there's so much that we fail to, to, to know, to be educated about, because we have in a lot of ways um, created these alternative narratives to where when we actually become educated, there's this like sense of shock of like, whoa, 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 that can't be the case because we've been taught to believe something else. Because if we were ever taught the truth, um, it would actually eat away at it. it would legitimately haunt us maybe is the way of saying it right like it would legitimately be something that like would haunt us so we've had to tell ourselves a lie which ultimately 
as we live in a world where we're seeing the results of those lies and the results of what took place. Um, and, and you had mentioned that I had been in Palestine and, and like one of the wild things um, that I noticed there was you have, you know, these maps that were drawn um, of occupation, you know, um, but, but even those maps that were drawn aren't even being honored. Uh, and, and you have um, land grabs taking place in Palestinian territory and these land grabs that have happened, we had visited multiple places where you saw these land grabs taking place and they would demolish homes and then build up new homes. And then people would come in and settle in those places. And you're just looking at the whole of like when, when we sat down and looked at all the maps and you're just seeing how much more complicated the problem is now than it was even 30, 40, 50 years ago, because you now have people who have, lived on that land for 20, 30, 40 years uh, who settled in that land because they were given that land by the government, even though that land wasn't the government's to give. And you just get this whole complicated reality of like, how is in, how is this huge not going to be untangled now? Um, because it has so many different moving parts, you know what I mean? Not only does the prejudice have to be tackled that's within the spirit of two different people right um but you also now have the economic realities of it the um just so much going on the the political realities right um what like what do you do to give a church and i'm going to frame this question as a pastor as someone who's just incredibly exhausted with the white evangelical church um just beyond exhausted with, with that particular community, I'm trying to have grace to say, okay, they have to have the next rung on the ladder. I can't give them rung 20, you know what I mean? And expect them to be there when they haven't necessarily uh, grabbed hold of, you know, starting from where they are, but how do you guys even work with churches or encounter other people, maybe even people who um, might resist the work you're doing um, and try to give them, something to grab hold of to just get started, even if they're nowhere near ready to have conversations about reparations, decolonization, and what actual like reconciliation looks like. How can someone start from a place that um, maybe is in no way open to this, but begin to kind of get that ball rolling, or at least something in their spirit moving that might down the road, open them up to deeper conversations? Have you guys had much traction in that or experience? We, um, we think the best way to begin is to begin with who we are and where we are mm. and what we know and what we don't know. And that's why the first two thirds of this book are about interrogating um, our own um, collective story as families and communities to um, unsilence uh, the, there's a great term in <clears throat> some of the sociological literature called agnosia, this, this um, willful state of not knowing mm. um, the past um, or the land uh, or even our own family histories. Uh, the United States, um, the dominant culture in the U.S. is really predicated on, upon erasing the past behind us. Now, why, why, why are we so interested in doing that? Well, because there's a lot we don't want to talk about. There's a lot we don't want to be accountable to. Mm. Um, and, and every one of us is entangled in that story. So starting with where we are means to ask the simple question, whose land was this 300 years ago or mm. 400 years ago yeah. or 100 years ago? Um, <clears throat> and what happened and how did it happen? And how did my people come to this place? How did I come to this place? Um, and begin to revisit what turned out to be some, some very, very disturbing and unsettling uh, legacies <clears throat> uh, of how um, people were moved or murdered 
uh, how land was <coughs> uh, taken by um, fraud or policy. In, in Israel-Palestine, the haunting of uh, colonial um, expansion, settler expansion, is made obvious by the fact that that land is riddled with walls. Right, you saw them yep. when you were there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and that walls, everybody's got to live with that contradiction, or figure out a way to ignore that contradiction. Mm. In our society, and you know this because it's at the heart of your ministry around boundaries, um, we have all these invisible walls um, of what we talk about or refuse to talk about, or what we know and willfully don't know. Um, and we find that just when, when we moved uh, 15 years ago to where we are now, one of the first things we did is we saw a particular historical marker that um, told a, a, a small little lie about um, Spanish colonization and indigenous survivance. Mm. Uh, and it took us 10 years to get to the bottom of that story. Um, because nobody was talking about it, or nobody knew it, or <clears throat> and uh, and that opened up what it means for us now to stand in solidarity with um, the very small community of indigenous survivors of um, first Spanish, then Mexican, and then American colonization of the land that we are on. Um, now we don't have to do that. As, as entitled white people, we can just settle and resettle wherever we want. We never have to ask those questions. But if we want to start with who we are and who our people were and where we are and what happened here, um, then we find that we're actually not innocent of all of that. We're, it is, this is something that, that matters if we want to be reconcilers and justice makers in this place. Um, well, and, I, and I just want to add a second part, an equally important part of that conversation is who, who were the people, the original inhabitants of the land where we are now, and wh where are they now? I, mm. I think some white settlers really do assume that Indigenous people are just gone. Um, and so doing the hard work of understanding the um, ways that indigenous folks were forced off their land, how some managed to stay, who are those people, um, who, who are the different individual tribes that were a part of this land, um, and how can we begin um, to build relationship, understand that history, um, support their efforts at cultural revitalization and, and the work that they want to do, uh, not going in with answers of, you know, what we think should happen, which can sometimes be the approach of uh, settler Christians, but building authentic relationships and supporting um, how indigenous folks are uh, working towards justice, uh, the work they want to do. So, there's, yeah. uh, there's a Jewish synagogue in the Bay Area that decided to become part of the Segorate Land Trust, um, uh, which is an indigenous Ohlone uh, project um, in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And what they've done is they've um, put together in um, collaboration with settlers, allies, a, a voluntary land tax in which settlers living on Ohlone land voluntarily pay a land tax to the so Sogorate Land Trust um, so that uh, Ohlone people can um, recover culturally from the fact that every single one of the shell burial mounds, more than 500 of them throughout the Bay Area has been destroyed by settler development every single burial mound to the Ohlone people. And wow. so this is a project among the Ohlone that's trying to um, <clears throat> recover some of those sites, make reburials, demand back the remains of their ancestors from museums. Um, and, 
and so it, it's a really interesting idea where you can voluntarily, it's a civil society tax, pay, pay your rent on your apartment or on your church building to an indigenous institution as a way of um, figuring out partnership. Um, mm. in, in New York, uh, up the Hudson River in Stony Point, our friends at Stony Point Presbyterian Church uh, had a shrinking congregation. They were trying to figure out what to do with the, with, with the building. And they ended up through a long um, process of uh, contacting local indigenous people and gifting it to them. And now it's a, a local indigenous cultural center. And it is a, um, a sign and a symbol of an experiment of goodwill and redistributive justice mm. and relationship building between these two communities. Um, so we either have um, experiments um, of um, relationship building or we have hauntings. Um, we have a shooting, um, two mass shootings in the space of a week that remind us that we are a society that idolizes the gun uh, mm, yeah. and refuses to manage or control the gun. Uh, we have um, indigenous people right now in the snow resisting pipelines in Minnesota and in British Columbia um, that are part of the carbon economy that enables us all to drive wherever we want. And these indigenous people are still insisting that their lands and waters um, need to be respected. Uh, and these extractive corporations um, cannot simply impose their wills. Um, and, and, and so there are these encampments happening right now. Mm. Uh, that's a haunting. Um, George Floyd's death is a haunting. So we, we either are going to be haunted in our landscape or we are going to sort of um, find small points of light where we are experimenting in modest ways uh, to know our history and to repair our history. That's, that's the, the choice we have in terms of this country and Christian church um, participation mm. in that history. Um, so yeah, we, we think um, as Elaine said, there's no step that's too small, no step that's too big. And we have lots of suggestions that are both personal and political in the book. Oh, that's good. That's good. The The land on which my house stands and where I'm currently is part of um, the ancient homeland of this Susquehannock people. And uh, if anyone's curious, like wherever you're listening from, uh, I don't know if you guys have resources, but one of the resources I really appreciate is uh, native-land.ca. And it gives you a big interactive map of maybe even you could look at where you were born, where you've lived and where you're living currently. I went back through every place I had lived in my life and kind of just studied a little bit about um, the, uh, the native peoples to those lands. And uh, it was pretty illuminating. Um, and I, I, I still need to do the work of actually like getting to know Susquehannock people in my area. And, um, but I do think even just an acknowledgement of the land you're on and being aware of that is a huge step forward. Is there any other resources you guys recommend in that? Cause I know for a lot of people, that's a, that was a new concept to me, even a couple of years ago, honestly, once I went to, to, um, to Israel and Palestine, while I was there, I, I was kind of having a crisis of conscience in some way of recognizing that like what I'm experiencing here, uh, has happened where I'm at and is happening where I'm at, but just not in the sense of a wall. Right. And so it made me more interested in, you know, discovering more about that and learning more about that. Uh, what, is there any other resources you guys recommend just for anybody who maybe is uh, on a surface level kind of getting engaged in that? Well, I, we just appreciate you naming that going to Israel, Palestine helped you see what was happening um, in your home place. And sometimes that is what we need to do. Uh, we need to get out of our place and see um, the horrible violence elsewhere, which pulls back um, the blinders on our eyes. So mm. we're 
able to see what's happening at home. And we, we do talk about that in our book. The website you mentioned is excellent. And we really commend um, your practice uh, to, all of, to all of the listeners to, to uh, do the hard work of finding out who the original people were of the land that, that uh, we live on. A practice that both came to both Chad and mine's mind is, it's, all, it's also described in our book, but it's our dear friend, Rose Marie Berger, um, a senior editor with Sojourners who, mm when we were able to go on driving trips. So a number of years ago, she went on a driving trip and she, before she entered each new territory, she, she, before she began, she did research of where she was gonna be traveling and whose indigenous territory historically and currently she was going to cross. And she made contact with those folks because there's a lot of uh, ways to do that um, on the internet and said she would like to pay a, uh, a fee to, to be a visitor through their territory. And you know, some people she didn't hear back from and they may not have gotten the email or whatever, but she had some wonderful um, exchanges with a number of indigenous groups that were so grateful that she as a settler took the time to learn where she was traveling on this car trip from DC down to the South and, to, and for her to acknowledge this is all the different territory and all the different people's home places that I am traveling through. Wow. That's interesting you say that because we're actually, my wife and I are planning a potentially like a cross country RV trip with the kids and nice. I have three, I have three kids and we were, we were talking about how many states we could knock off, you know, like yeah. have a map of all the states and like, you know, do the whole magnet thing. It could be really cool to even have, um, you know, an indigenous map to be able to say, we've been in these territories and in some way try to, you know, honor those as we go through there, at least to have an awareness of what land we're on, even as we're traveling that way, I hadn't even thought about it. But as you were saying that it made me think even about our upcoming trip that we're in like the very, very early stages of planning, obviously, COVID has challenged vacations and stuff like that. But, um, but we're thinking about that. And that that could be something for even our, our kids to incorporate for us personally, but certainly even to, to help our kids understand that that reality too. So well, yeah, yeah well, I just think, and as you're, you're talking about doing that for your children, one of the things I learned um, from one of the uh, elders in my community who was very a white settler, very involved in indigenous settler relations, his name is Leonard Dole, a uh, Mennonite guy, and he was committed. Whenever he told his grandchildren a story about the Mennonites or about settler Mennonites, he would also tell a story about the indigenous people of the land that we were on. And so your responsibility as a parent, right? To, mm -hmm. yeah, cool to click off all those states that you're gonna be traveling to, but also, like you say, telling the story of the indigenous people's lands who you're traveling through. and. For, for us to be so aware of, of the stories we tell to little children. Are they all you know, within our community and not a word of the indigenous people that live here? Or can we figure out how to start that education from a very young age that the stories of indigenous peoples are as important to our healing and growth and development as settlers as the stories are of, say, our Mennonite ancestors. Mm. And, and <clears throat> as, as you know, just as how we narrate something shapes our consciousness, yeah. um, right? So for you to have made the moves that you've made theologically and ecclesially over the past 15 years, um, you've had to reshape narratives and critically interrogate narratives, receive narratives, so too, how we map the world shapes our consciousness. Yeah. When we look at a map of these 50 states, 
we're looking at um, the result of a 400 year colonial project to divide and conquer and occupy that is enshrined in every one of these state boundaries. And when you overlay um, maps, indigenous maps um, onto that, it begins to problematize that simple story of um, you know, clicking off 50 states like it's a, like it's a game and it's good to have card games, mm -hmm. um, but it's good to problematize these things and, and thereby plant seeds. We plant seeds in ourselves and our children, in our friends, in our um, congregation that are going to um, subvert the simple story. Um, because there's now no longer one way to map the world. There's now no, you know, no longer just one dominant story. And that opens up the possibility to step into um, a new openness. Because ultimately, uh, this work, and that's the first, first word in the book, uh, book's title, this work, work is about our healing. We are the ones, said Dr. King, who have this incredible disease, um, and we need to X-ray it to find the roots of it. Um, and we want to be made whole. That's what um, relationship with God is about: is being made whole. Um, so this isn't just um, oh my gosh, it's another social justice agenda on top of all the social justice agendas that Pastor Justin's already given us. Um, <laughs> actually, this is, hey, do we, how deep do we want to go in yeah. here? How many layers uh, are we going to, are we going to uncover so that we can be well? Mm -hmm. um, and really our experience over and over again, as, as we um, uh, build relationships with indigenous folk, that's really all that they're looking for from us is mm. for us to get well because it's um, our disease is um, is an apocalypse for them and has been for 500 years. Black folks say the same thing. Um, LGBT folks say the same thing. So uh, this is about us getting well. And we think by going to the deepest roots here on this continent, we are embracing all the issues in between right up to the present. It's about us who are entitled in a dysfunctional system um, getting well so that we can practice with redistributive justice so that everybody can get well. Um, and I think, I think that's so good because it really brings back another emphasis of Jesus's ministry, which is, uh, and, I, and I think of this even in, in Martin Luther King Jr.'s ministry is like this love of enemies, this enemy love, and this desire that, um, you know, even the, like the racist needs to be made whole. Like that's the, that's the, it's not that we're going to eradicate racism by like excommunicating all racists or, you know, <laughs> killing all racists. Like we, we know war doesn't work. Like we know it just creates more problems. Right. But if, if it can, if people can be transformed, if people can um, you know, I, I always think of, you know, the Nicodemus story of, uh, you could even almost say Nicodemus was a form of, uh, an exorcism needing to be born again. That might be the most radical of exorcisms that that his perspective on the world needed to be born again, you know? And like the idea that when I see like the latest video of the person angry in line, calling someone, you know, a, a, a racial slur, the more and more I've seen those, the more and more I, I definitely empathize with the person who's being called that racial slur and the pain that they're experiencing in that moment. But I'm also like, wow, this person that's saying this has so much toxicity in their spirit that they need to be freed from so much, certainly ignorance and all that. But like you, you begin to say like a love for enemies is, is a love that says this person is redeemable. Like there's a possibility here for, um, for something new to even be birthed in this moment, in this person, hopefully different, you know? Um, I, I don't know. As a pastor, I have to hold on to that hope because I do really believe that we're all image bearers of God and that our stories aren't over no matter what we've done. Um, and I do think that's kind of the, when we talk about like healing haunted histories, it's like, 
some of us aren't even aware that we're being haunted right now. And some of us obviously aren't aware of our histories and even further, some of us aren't aware that we're even sick. And, and I think sometimes those kind of earth shattering moments that people find themselves in, I just know as a pastor around other things, not necessarily racism um, and racism, definitely too. I've had people come to me that are in a crisis moment, unaware that the last 10, 20, 30 years of their life, they had been a certain way until they had a crisis in their life that had led them to that point. And I mean, the struggle is we're kind of going through a collective crisis as a culture right now. And my hope is that people will examine themselves. And it seems like this book is going to do some work to help with that. So if people want to find out where this book is, if you want to share any more about it, a little more about maybe even uh, Bartimaeus Cooperative Ministries, links that they might want to, to discover more and to dive deeper and to maybe discover more about themselves and how they need healing. Can you uh, just share some of those or some closing thoughts about the book? Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks for that um, allusion to the fact that uh, Jesus of Nazareth um, had only one requirement um, to get well. And that was, you had to know you're sick. Um, mm, yeah. And, um, and that is why, you know, we're, we're fellow Anabaptists with you. Um, and Anabaptists oftentimes err on the side of trying to keep things uh, um, calm and, and, and quiet and polite. <laughs> uh, sometimes to make the peace, you have to disturb the peace. And this book, I suppose, is as much about disturbing the peace so that we can make the peace. This, this notion of Jesus as healer is really fundamental to our work at Bartimaeus Cooperative Ministries. The, the name Bartimaeus comes from um, <clears throat> Mark's second healing of uh, a blind man in Mark chapter 10, who gives up everything he has just in order to be able to see. And here we understand blindness and sight as uh, metaphors for consciousness and um, critical awareness of what's happening within and around us. Uh, so for us at Bartimaeus Cooperative Ministries, everything we do is about trying to get ourselves and folks like us to move from this metaphorical blindness to discipleship, from denial to discipleship on a whole range of, of concerns from economic disparity to immigrant rights, uh, restorative justice on lots of different fronts, um, ecological justice and climate crisis. Uh, that's our work as educators and advocates and organizers. Um, and this, uh, this project is, um, Elaine has been laboring on this book for 10 years. Um, and it is our latest attempt to uh, probe the roots. Where, where can folks find this book? Yeah. Um, if you would like to get a copy of this book or more information on this book, you can go to healinghauntedhistories.org. And there um, at the bottom of the page, there is a link um, to uh, get a 20% um, discount on the purchase of the book. Uh, the discount is available until May 31st. Um, and then that will take you directly to the publisher um, for you to be able to order the book. So yeah, please uh, go there if you're interested um, before May 31st so you can get that discount. What else is on that site? What will people find there? Reviews and some sure. background on the book. Yep, yep. More information on the book. Great. And I'll link, I'll link all those links in the, uh, in the show notes too, in the description. So if you're listening to this and you just want to get there really quick, just pull up the, the um, description. There should be a quick link to, uh, to healinghauntedhistories.org and also any of the other work. I know Bartimaeus Cooperative Ministries, there's a website for that too. I'll put that in there. Um, and any other links you guys send me that of social medias or anything that you would want people to follow. We want to make sure people get connected and stay connected to the work you're both doing and, uh, and you know, uh, ways that uh, many of these conversations can maybe continue or they can be connected to the work uh, 
uh, that you're doing. Any closing thoughts? Well, we appreciate uh, your your interest in in this project. Um, we know it's it's not a simple sound bite. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we we do believe that um, given the crisis of these times, which you have named, it is um, immensely important for people of faith and conscience to be willing and able to go deep, as deep as it takes mm. to heal ourselves and help heal the world. Um, this, uh, this is, <clears throat> we believe, the vocation of the church. Mm. And um, it is actually in a time when churches are falling apart, right, left and center, big box churches are unraveling, big denominations are um, spinning apart. Um, it may seem like the, the worst of times to be church, but in fact, it is the best of times to be church as well, because it uh, allows us to circle up and go deep in our tradition, in scripture, um, in, the, in the best of our Christian witness over the centuries, uh, to go deep into the roots of the pathologies that surround us and that inhabit us, uh, and to work together with our congregations and our neighbors to make things right. Uh, and we really encourage people like yourselves who are um, <clears throat> helping accompany folks on journeys to a deeper and wider liberation uh, and hope that we can um, help out along the way as, mm. as we all do that. Well, Chet and Elaine, I really appreciate both of you and all your work. I think, uh, I, I know uh, it must have taken a lot to write this. I'm sure you've experienced some pushback along the way, but I know this is going to be something that's going to challenge people, push people, and hopefully um, lead to more healing in our world. And uh, I'm thankful for this. I'm looking forward to purchasing it myself and uh and, and just growing in more knowledge and, and understanding even personally but as a pastor of how to even encourage my community to grow um in just acknowledgement and then hopefully even in reconciliation so uh thank you both for taking the time to be on the beyond boundaries podcast and um and share your book with us uh looking forward to seeing uh all the great that it does in the world Thank you so much, Justin. It's been really great uh, to be with you this afternoon. So thankful for Elaine and Shed and all their work. Please go check out their healinghauntedhistories.org. Again, the book is on sale through May 31st at a 20% discount. So please go there to buy the book. Also, their ministry website is bcm-net.org. That's Bartimaeus uh, Cooperative Ministries. Uh, the tagline for Bartimaeus Cooperative Ministries is revisioning the intersection of word and world, animating communities of discipleship and justice. So good. I, I love that tagline. Blessings on all of their work. As always, may you go and live a life that is beyond boundaries, giving others love, exploring new ideas, and championing belonging.